Welcome everybody, welcome. This is, I think, the final panel of them all. And uh, we are very excited to have with us Judith Thurman and Denisha Smith. Um, we're going to be discussing many things, but in fact, we're going to be focusing on life writing in one way or another. So um, Denisha has just published the book, The Honeymoon. It's about the life of George Eliot. She used to write, and still do, you still write for the New York Times. And uh, you've written other novels as well, and a uh, wonderful writer and wonderful book. And uh, Judith, you have two biographies already out, and you write for The New Yorker, and we're really very, I'm very happy to have you here. And I'm going to be moderating and starting the conversation. Um, and I'll start with you. <laughs> and we, we're going to come at you from both sides. Uh, and it's, um, the idea is, why write a novel about George Eliot when <laughs> most people would prefer to write a, a biography. biography? And you've done all the research, of course. Yeah, that's actually, well, that's right to the point. Uh, the novel is centered on a, an event in George Eliot's life about which very little is understood or known from the existing archives. And that is a late life marriage. She was 60, which then was quite a bit older. She was in poor health. She had lost the love of her life, George Henry Lewis. Her life was over. And there was a young man who was a friend of the family. He's 40, very handsome, very rich. And he begged her to marry him. And they went on their honeymoon to Venice, and they wrote back, We're, I found love again. It's so wonderful. I'm so happy. But when they got to their hotel, he, made, he jumped off the balcony of their suite, and he tried to kill himself, but he was rescued by the gondoliers. So it's not very funny, but I... <laughs> and it's sort of archetypal, but so little was known about it, and it's been weighing on me for years. Did this mean that this woman's life ended in, in a sort of tragedy? They made their way back to uh, England, to her estate, then they moved to London, to their brand new house, which Michael Bloomberg has just bought on Cheney Walk, and they, three weeks later, she died. So I was sort of haunted by this because she's kind of a literary heroine for me, as she is for many writers, and I wanted to understand it. So I, this was my way of understanding this marriage, and I used a lot of um, primary and secondary sources, but that was the reason. Be, you know, it's like a page in these biographies. Let me ask you this. I mean, what was the, the, what was the thrill in writing about a, a novel based on the life of an author that you like? Well, I have to confess, was inevitably you identify somewhat with the person that you're writing about. And so I read, the, I read about, I you know, learned a great deal about the 19th century. It was That was great fun. But with her, the, there was certain joys. One was she was an extremely good person, moral in my view, generous, kind, very strong, in addition to being the most, probably the most famous writer of her day, maybe Turgenev and Dickens came before her. But she, so she, I was, I had always wondered, you know, if there is some innate conflict between being a genius and a good human being, but that was exciting. But to learn about her and sort of identify with her as an awkward girl who was self-educated, she taught herself Latin, Hebrew, Greek, uh, French, German, Italian, was pulled out of school at 16. All this. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you, uh, how you researched and sourced her husband's background, because so much is known about her. She was a prolific letter writer and a marvelous letter writer. Many biographies have been written, you know, starting in the late um, 19th century. Yeah. But what existed about him in, in what real documents existed Are about you, him? You're referring to John Cross, yes. the final, yes. That was an, another fascinating problem because very little is known about him. I was able to do some additional research. One of the most important things that's happened to historians and biographers is m a lot of the archives that are digitized, especially in large institutions. So now I could do research that 
perhaps wasn't available to biographers about him. I, I, I gleaned every little fact that I, I did the family tree, I studied the newspaper accounts of his um, family's merchant banking business, which they were Scottish bankers. Um, I, I discovered he went to rugby. There were also the rumors that he had been, there was insanity in the family, you know. So I, <clears throat> mostly through archival research and, and what the impressions of her friends. Um, for example, she had a woman friend who was almost a stalker and she wrote a huge long book about Marion and her marriage to Johnny. So that was a big help. There were these other accounts. I can imagine it would have been not easy, but relatively, um, relatively easy to get into George Eliot's head. But what about Johnny's head? Well, see, I told the, to the whole novel from her point of view. I didn't right. go into his head. And um, from what was the other reason to write the novel was she was very much a proper woman, a woman of her time, didn't confide her love affairs to, in her diaries. <clears throat> she didn't so that was missing from the whole, all her letters and diaries. It's somewhat missing. So I would go to her poetry. I would go to some letters that her husband did not destroy after she died because he sort of sanitized her life. There was a diary found in 1913 of one of her lovers which, <laughs> which said every time they made love, he, she was living in a sort of boarding house with him, his wife, and the governess, who was his mistress. So she came up and became his mistress also. So that diary revealed some things. You know, it wasn't found until 1913. And so they, that was part of it. So, well, I want to get to her husband a bit later, because yeah. um, it, it becomes interesting. Um, she meets, I was interested in that, because I had read about it elsewhere. She meets Franz Liszt. Oh, yes. Tell us about that meeting. In the war. I adored that. Um, okay, so we know she, she wrote an autobiographical essay about meeting List. List was like Mick Jagger. He right, was, exactly. Women would, he'd break the strings on the piano, and women would take the strings as a souvenir and make them into a bracelet. He, this was, and he had long hair, you know, he was just. So she went to visit him and described it as the first time she had ever seen real inspiration in Weimar, where she, when she ran off with George Henry Lewis, the wonderful man <coughs> who made her career possible by bolstering her ego, which was not great. So there was the bio, uh, she wrote an essay about meeting Liszt, then there's a, several biographies of Liszt which have an account. I, I was able to learn the name of Liszt's dog, Rappo. He had a little dog that used to bark while he was practicing. And he called, Liszt called him my best critic. So anyway, <laughs> but the fun part, you asked what was fun, was I had to figure out what he might have played. Okay. So I knew there were a group of um, compositions called... Um, Benedictions? Yes, right. And there, there are several of them. And I had to find out you know, he, she doesn't, she just says that he played from this group. She doesn't say which of them. So I chose one. And you see that, I knew it was composed before this meeting in Weimar. And so I have him play that. And I, that's how I, in a sense, wrote the novel, by adding that. So that was, he, you know, George Henry Lewis was a great critic. He had written about Liszt in, in his own magazine, The Leader. and. She did not really have a big reputation then. She was the editor of the Westminster Review, which was one of the great literary journals in London. But she didn't have, um, you know, she was, he wasn't meeting this super famous person. It was really George that she liked. So basically, as a novelist, mm -hmm. you extrapolated which of those benedictions that he was going to play. Yes, I how, did. How does, and I, I don't mean to get personal, but how does the man who shares your address, who's also a famous biographer, <laughs> right. feel about that extrapolation? Well, there you get to the nut of the problem, because um, we have a lot of discussions, and I think that's partly why we're here. Um, my husband's an historian, which is important because his... Um, there's a certain exigency in what he does. He would never, never do what I did in this novel. And 
this is the heart of the matter, but even in the historian's profession there is a debate now whether or not there the narrative is constructed, whether in a sense it's a kind of fiction, history. So that's the gray area that um, you've talked about a lot in your essays. Yeah, yeah but did you guys fight about this? Uh, no, because, um, <laughs> not really because he's lived with me through three other novels, but <laughs> you know, this one, um, I was determined to adhere to the known truth. I never violated it, to my knowledge, except compressing a few events, the chronology. But so that what my job was to fill it in. So I couldn't, having been a New York Times reporter, I couldn't just ignore that. What I couldn't, un, I just wasn't able to. But I had all the chronologies and the diaries. I had the railway timetables, which were great, and the guidebooks. And, right. you know. Judith, how do you feel about that? You, you, you wrote biographies. Yes. Well, I, yeah, I was going to say the, the notion of the imaginative connection with the subject, which I don't think is necessarily 100% in my case true. Uh, I remember I was asked when uh, um, Dinesen came out, I was a young biographer, and literary biography was very much in vogue, and there was a big cover story in Time magazine. And the young reporter kept saying to me, well, how did you identify with her? And I said, well, it wasn't so much an identification. I was trying to understand her. I was trying to go the, the various layers that, that composed her life and her world. I was trying to sort of get into them. But there were some ways in which I didn't identify with her at all. It was even more true of Colette. She said, well, there must be something. And I said, well, the strangest thing was is that I discovered after the book was published that the perfume that I've always worn, Fraca, was her perfume. And the article comes out and it says, Judith Thurman identified so deeply with her subject that she wore her perfume <laughs> to invoke her. I hate that. Oh. <laughs> and and I, I, for me, it's sort of like separation when you're a child from a parent because a subject of biography, is a, can, it can be an overwhelming and invasive relationship. So I have kept my subjects at a certain distance. Um, and there are always moments of... of uh, whatever you could say, of submission in a way, where you do enter into their, or you feel that you're entering into their, their psyches, their, 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 um, their hearts. But for me, it was a much, I think it was a more formal, uh, w not adversarial, but uh, there was, I kept the tension, or I tried to. Okay. As it should be, I think. Which is completely different in fiction. You Absolutely, it should be that way, um, I think. But I was thinking, I mean, you, you must, there must be a biography where that process of identification with the subject you felt was gawky, awkward, not right. Have you ever felt that? In, in other people's work? Yeah. Yes, well, there's hagiography, there's, and there's also, on right. the other hand, there's like a psychopathology, uh, pathography, mm -hmm. uh, where people are so uh, invested, either negatively or positively, that the lines really do blur and that they, there's sort of a, a kind of, you're, the, the biographer is speaking about himself or herself, not about the subject. Right, and they're right. attributing all kinds of intimate feelings and thoughts to the subject that they can't possibly know. Right. Um, um, I, I wanted to read a passage from your book because I thought it was, and I want you to comment on it. Do you mind? Oh, no. Okay. Um, this is when they're in Venice. Um, she noticed again the sinew of the gondolier's forearms the strength of the muscles. As she sank back into the shade of the tendaline, she felt a kind of fear at the man's quiet, his seemingly inhuman indifference to them. This is the gondolier. He had them in his power. She had a sudden sense of being rowed to her doom of the gondolier, like Charon, unclean with hollow eyes, rowing them across the river to the land of the dead. She felt a headache coming on from the heat and the jagged reflection of the sunlight on the water. I think that's actually very beautiful. Um, and and I was, as I was reading this, I couldn't help remembering that even the description that Thomas Mann has of, yes, of going exactly. under the gun, were you thinking of it? Yes, I you? was. <laughs> there you are, I stole Tell it. us more, tell us more. Well, only in, in Death in Venice, he has the same sense of, of, um, of I think he mentions Charon, Exactly. Does he mention Charon? I, I think he remember. does. Um, but certainly there's a sort of um, a theme going through the, the story of death. As well. Can you think of a story set in Venice by a non-Italian that's not about death? Well said. 
Um, I mean, it's really hard, but uh, keep going. I, I'm just, this just well, came to me. Uh, um, you are asking me, yes, I was aware of, of yeah. um, Thomas Munn. Um, what is the other question, though? I loved writing that passage. Right. Because uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful this, um, this gondolier, um, that, the sexuality of the, the book comes into play here. Well, that's what, where yes. I wanted to go. Yes, um, because I had to understand why did she marry him? What did he want from her? You have, she was extremely plain. She was in very poor health. And why did he want to marry her? He is young, handsome, and rich. But he begged her. So I wanted to understand what was possibly going on sexually. That's what we've all wanted to understand. Yeah. <laughs> and I really, really thought about it. And so I feel that he may have been gay, but he probably, before Oscar Wilde, didn't identify himself as, I'm gay. He had gone to rugby, an English boarding school, where people had exper uh, sexual experiences with the same sex. Um, so my h hunch is that the reason he committed suicide, Lord Acton, mm -hmm. who was a married homosexual, said after she died that Johnny, she had made a sexual gesture towards him, and Johnny had jumped off <laughs> you know, well, than, maybe that's legit. You know, that's possible. Well, I just don't think that's what happened. My conclusion was that she probably initially wanted a mariage blanc. Okay. You know, she was afraid. She was not in good health. She didn't really. She was a shy, very shy woman. Always thought she was homely. And I, I envision her saying to him, "Well, we could get married, but we mustn't have." A physical relationship. But, so that's that was your extrapolation. Was, yes, okay. and he agrees. But I think his decision, or rather his impulse to jump off the balcony, was not related to anything to do with his sexuality. Um, I, I there were there were discussions about how there had been insanity in Johnny's right. family, and that he had had a breakdown before this, and his behavior fit a pattern of mania. After they were married, he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, he was running around getting ready for the honeymoon. And uh, so that's what I think. That's what you think, okay. Um, because, uh, there's another passage that I want. I like want. that better because otherwise it's so tragic. It's so <laughs> Which part do you like better? That uh, the, the part that he was manic and, and was having a manic episode rather than that she, this, this marvelous, brilliant, yes. incredibly homely old woman, uh, wanted the embrace of this beautiful, much younger man, and he was so horrified and stricken that he wanted to kill himself. That has always been unbearable to contemplate. I agree, and I, th I thought it was very cruel of Lord Acton to say this. He wasn't known for his kindness. No, no, he wasn't, and I thought it was just something he couldn't know, and um, although Johnny lived with Lord Acton after she died, um, but um, th I decided he, had a valence towards males, whether, but then one night he gets drunk in Venice. I, the name Corradini appears in the archives, and then. Right. Well, then you have him going with Corradini, the the gondolier, and disappears into the night. Right. And and there is, I mean, I'm supposed to assume, okay, they didn't just play poker. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> there was a very big gay scene in Venice in the 19th right. century, and there were a lot of John Addington Simons lived sure. in Venice with his wife and the gondolier, his lover, and his gondolier's family. They all lived together. So it wouldn't have been totally odd that, and then I researched the locations, the, the, as you call it in modern times, queer space, which was the Rialto, around the Rialto. Right. And so I have him go to the Rialto, and he comes, he's drunk, and we don't quite know what happened. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> and we, we, we're only allowed to see some, but there is another moment where I thought you were, again, uh, I don't mean to compliment you that much. Oh, please, but please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally happy to But be this, is, this is another moment when she's with Chapman, and it's, it's a small incidental detail, but it caught my attention. Um, and this is the fact that they sleep together, but he is married. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, but the more indifferent she tried to pretend she was to his lovemaking, the greater pleasure it was, as if the mask of indifference satisfied her need for self-punishment, her guilt at once more surrendering to a man who belonged to someone else, who couldn't love her, who could only hurt her. 
Okay, here's a question. Yes. Uh, and I'm asking this How as How intimate is this question going to be? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go talking about cars. Okay, uh, no, but uh, this, is, this is an amazing insight. In other words, uh, the fact that she is, she finds that the indifference that she feels is actually sexually thrilling. Yes, us. but I think that's true of moralists. I think yes. that <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that indifference is a moralist's vacation spot. Okay. <laughs> well said. That I'm going to print up and put over my typewriter. Especially right. sexually, because if you are yeah. constantly attuning yourself to every nuance of another person and to every nuance yeah. of right and wrong, and then you are in bed with somebody you don't have to care, I think that's a vacation. That and it could be very so erotic. interesting. I, it's, it was true. Now, it's not, not a, it's a different case, but Nadine Gordimer, who was a great moralist, um, wrote a very, uh, not one of her great, um, her great uh, books, Sport of Nature, which is really also a moralist vacation about a wild girl who sleeps her way through the ranks of the ANC and so forth and so on. And you felt that her her absolute lack of uh, distance from this character, whom she dotes upon, <laughs> and, and sort of maternal narcissism is a theme of the book, but she dotes upon Halela in an incredibly narcissistic way. And I thought that she's on vacation. And I wrote this in the review. It was my first piece that I wrote for The New Yorker 30 years ago. Um, and I, when I, I came to that conclusion, it was, ah, I get it. I in other that. words, the author was on a moralist vacation The as well. author was on a moralist vacation. As, yes. as long as well as the character in the sort. The, char the character, her, her life was a vacation from morality, but the, the <laughs> author was that was not not true of the author at all. I think but that's very interesting insight. There, well, people have you know forbidden sex. It's well that may be not that may be more enthusiastic sex than pretending that you're not feeling anything. But that's right. But basically the pretense that you, or the assumption that you're not feeling much and that you don't care that much yes. sort of liberates you. But I love the insight, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually... No, that's a, it's beautiful. I want to write, I want to copy that down too. I, I'd love you to talk more about Eliot as a transgressor because, mm -hmm. uh, yes, she was a great moralist, but this is, this is one of the dialectics in her life. There's, in biography, in the early stages of biography, you try to find the dialectic because there are two poles, they're artificial and close up they collapse, but there are usually two poles and a life is strung between them. In the case of he's like Denison, it was Kierkegaard's either or, but in hers it's morality and transgression because look at this woman, she lived in sin. In Victorian England, Queen Victoria was reading her novels but wouldn't have her to tea because she couldn't. She could not be received by any respectable woman because she was living with a man, poor man's wife was insane, he couldn't divorce her, but nevertheless, they were living. In. She was living in a menage of millions in the day. <laughs> right. So I, I, I want to know well, how you, okay, your take. She on was it. very, very proper. Uh, she was. She had an, a religious crisis when she was a young woman in her early twenties. She was devoted to her father. Refused to go to church with him anymore. He was right. uh, Anglican, and she found, she started her own religion, which she called the religion of humanity. It emanated from one's love of one's fellow man, one's caring for a child, and so on. Okay, so she, ha she was terribly moral. And what happened with George Henry Lewis was she, he could not marry her because he was already married and the divorce laws were structured in such a way. Well, basically what had happened is um, his, he had an open marriage with his wife, Agnes. Agnes proceeded to have four children with his best friend. Thornton Hunt, the son of Lee Hunt, the friend of, Ke of Shelley and Keats. Okay, so he gave these children his name on the birth certificate, and for that reason, legally, he had condoned the adultery. For that reason, he couldn't get a divorce. He tried, actually. So she made this enormous, enormous leap into this, you know, her brother stopped talking to her for 26 years, the brother to whom she adored. But all along, she insisted on being called Mrs. Lewis. She in, in, you know, would not, she got mad if someone wrote Miss Evans on a, on a letter. She always referred to him as husband. And it's, you know, the Victorians had a little bit more sex than we envision. <laughs> you know, Peter Gay wrote, um, you know, about that. We envision them as 
well, they were horrible hypocrites, but they, there was a lot of this free thinking, open marriage stuff among intellectuals. Um, that, um, you know, she, she, she was, we think, probably a very sensual woman from the little we could glean. Um, so that she and George were, you know, had a very romantic relationship. So um, her morality was kind of extraordinary. She had great moral courage. He was her husband, and that was it. She, this was a different kind of marriage, but she believed in it, even if her brother wouldn't speak to her. The brother, interestingly enough, after she married John, for the first time oh, he God. could write to her as Mrs. Cross. And after 26 years, now she didn't matter who she was married to, to this kid, he, she was legitimately married and he could write right. to her. It was but terrible. That, that is so horrible. I mean, so that is the Victorian part that yes. we all sort yes. of have heard about. And I mean, I, I also think that the Victorians were not as puritanical as we make them seem. They were hypocrites, probably no more than we are. But. Uh, <laughs> But the, the, the fact is that this, this bro can you talk about the brother a bit more? Because... Well, okay, um, he was a country boy, he was a little older, she worshipped him. Those of you who have read The Mill on the Floss, right. probably too early in middle school or something like that, which, which I don't advise, it because it is a great novel. But she worshipped him. He was a country, I don't know, know the proper term because the father was the manager of a gigantic estate which still exists, by the way, in Warwickshire. He was just a narrow, provincial, um, rather, I think rather stupid man. He wasn't as smart as she was in school. And in a bizarre way, the father favored her, his little mm -hmm. wench. So Smart one. The great women writers in my, not universal, We've but large experience, here were daddy's girls. That is fascinating. They were all daddy's girls. Um, that is and, and in fact, the spunky heroines of literature are often motherless. Yes, because the mother was very withdrawn. Eliot's mother and, was very. Uh, well, the Brontes weren't exactly daddy's girls. They were daddy's wardens or daddy's yeah. slaves. Mm -hmm. But there was, but um, yeah. And so that's not surprising. So both Colette and Isaac Dinesen were? Dinesen was madly in love with her father who committed suicide when she was 10. But he was the lodestar for her, very much so. She identified with him. Um, and Colette, of Colette that wasn't true, but Colette was gay. So again, it's uh, partly, she was bisexual, she was uh, sort of omnisexual. But, but Colette was very much identified with her mother, but then she, uh, her mother was in a way the dominant figure, the father figure in the family. The mother was the competent, worldly, take mm -hmm. care of everything. And the father was the, was the ineffectual dreamer. So Colette made the identification with power and separation through her mother, but wow. that's pretty exceptional. That's very interesting. What other great female writers Anne can Frank. you? Anne Frank is pretty notable. Yes. Anne Frank was total daddy's girl. In fact, the diary so interesting in that the mother plays such a minor role in it. Really? I hadn't thought of that. I never and, thought of that um, either. Very interesting. Uh, Jane Austen, I'm not sure of. Um, you can go down, let's see, you could sort of work your way down uh, through literature and see it, mm -hmm. it's... Um, it's funny that we don't have that many references up to no. the 19th century. When we come into this era, we begin, we, uh, m most of the, w this flour flowering of female writers, which occurs in, somewhat in the post-war period, um, we don't yet have all their biographies, no. do we? So we don't know, but, but it, as we search for references for w great women writers whose fathers had a strong influence, it's... Almost all of them were also childless. Yes, Almost that was another one. thing. Oh my God, that was very. Emily important. Dickinson was somebody who identified very strongly with her. her the father was the strong parent. In yeah. That um, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a very strange thing. I, yes, I never sort is. of configured it that way, but it's true. I wonder about men. What do they? <laughs> I have another theory. This is this is a pop theory. I should have a website of, of idiotic <laughs> literary pop theory. Many great male writers have mothers who married beneath them. They either married, they I, married beneath the husbands. They either married beneath them socially, or they married beneath them 
um, in intelligence. They married beneath I think them. Melville's mother had the money, right? That family, the mother's family, and then who else uh, can you think of? And, and so the mothers uh, identified with the sons and wanted to make the sons the, the princely figure they felt they deserved. This isn't. A, this doesn't hold true. This is only. This is a lot of. This is a sieve of a theory with a lot of holes in it. But I've been struck over the years, reading and reading and reading for you know 50 years, uh, that it's true in many cases. Okay. Well, that makes me a very Thank bad you. writer. Because <laughs> my mother certainly did not marry beneath her. Uh, she thought she did, but it's. Uh, <laughs> That's no, 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 mattered. that's what counts. That's I what know counts. that's what no. counts, yes. Absolutely. Uh, she reminded him, she told him. He said, no, that's not true at all. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to go into my family squabbles. This is not... Um, well, we're going to have some more questions, but... So the, the brother incident was interesting. And I also, there's one moment where they're on, they're swimming together, or she's, he's in the water, and she is following him in the water. This is the yeah. husband, Johnny. And, and he pushes her. Yes. Did he actually push her? Okay, what do I know about that? that. This is the Lido. She, they, we know they went swimming, or he wanted to, we know he wanted to go swimming from the diary, but right. she didn't want him to. And we know that he did go swimming. Okay, so by that time, I think he was pretty much going over the edge, and she, the novel's all about, she realizes something is happening, right. doesn't know how to quantify it. No, not that I know of. I tried, I spent a lot of time on that, trying to figure out, okay, he goes into the water, he demands to go in the water. She doesn't want him to go in the water. It's hot and it's crowded. And, and she's wearing a burqa almost. <laughs> she she's almost she's, wearing she's not burqa. taking her clothes yeah. off. You and know? he, yeah. he go, strips down to his um, whatever you call combination. And he goes in the water and she runs down because she's, she's aware that he is in trouble. Yeah. And right. she wants to pull him back. So and that's, I made that up. You made, and so he. But that that makes sense, though. I think psychologically. Thank that you. Makes sense. But I coming love to, from a biographer. No, no. <laughs> I, I'd love to talk about the the, the, the freedom and the limitations of the freedom of fiction, the limitations yes. of fact. Yes. That uh, and but you've written. I know you've your wonderful memoirs. But have you ever written a novel? I don't know if you have. Yeah. Two. Yeah. You've written right, two? two. I have to read them immediately. More than two. Uh, have you written? Three? But people accuse me of writing biographically my novels. Oh, well, let's talk about this. Let's talk then. about That's a very interesting topic. No, I'm topic. trying to avoid that subject. <laughs> Why not? No, you're not. We I have love 17 that minutes no, and 42 my, seconds. No, because my memoir, they say, oh, you made it all up, which is not true, not entirely. And then my, <laughs> my novels, they say, oh, this is coming right from life. Well, and and well, that's not quite name? right. Yes. That's course, from life. People think, oh, God, I've been paid compliments for, they asked me, how are the two men doing? I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was asked this two weeks ago. How they, are they still with us, you know? And I'm going, and I'm going like, I'm sorry, you know? You told, I've heard you speak in public about this, and I remember some anecdote. Was it Colm Toybean? Yeah. What did, do you oh, want to repeat? I was trying to basically trying to find out if I had gone to bed with men, and I didn't want to answer that question. Well, that was right. none of his business. Right. Uh, but the, the the real the real issue is, people basically it's it's very nice when they tell me that they believed it so much that it has to have happened, and the other stuff it's equally complimentary. In other words, it feels like a real novel to them. Yes. Yeah. So the, the memoir, and they, they yes. say, how could you remember this conversation? I say, I don't remember it, I made it up. Okay. In the memoir. But yeah, but those are the, the infinite quarrels that occur yeah. between real life writing right. and sort of the novelized, and then you have that middle mist in the middle, which is the memoir. And I've, basically, I always, I don't think I make things up, but I change them so much that people can't, everybody tells me, this was, they always ask me this question, this was me, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and, and at some point, I've figured the best thing to do is not to say, no, it's not, absolutely not. I just go and I say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that gives them the compliment that they needed, and we move on. <laughs> anyway, any questions? In, is, is it time for questions now? Uh, yes, it's time for okay. questions. The public has to ask. Now, please remember no, that you can ask a question as long as you want and make it as long, but you cannot make a statement. As somebody told me, those statements, you can save them for Twitter. Uh, okay. They're always shy in the beginning, audiences. Just it has to, one person has to break it. Um, 
I don't know if this is working, and now it is. Yeah. Yes, you are. Um, Andre, this is directed at you. Um, in Teju Cole's new book of essays, there's actually an essay um, uh, on you, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read it yet or if you have any response to it, but it he talks... It was published about three years ago, so I did Oh, okay. It. <laughs> it, the book just came out, so... Yeah, I know. Um, but he talks about your affinity for um, deferred desire, and, and since you did the Proust... Um, panel, which I greatly enjoyed. I just wanted to, if you could expand on that subject, did it come straight from Proust or anything? The, the notion of desire. Deferred desire. Oh, deferred well, desire. That's what, that's what Cole was saying. You uh, had an affinity to writing about deferred de desire. Yes, I think that, well, I mean, if you are writing about something that you desired and that you had, Frankly, that's not that interesting, okay? And, and, and to be quite honest with you, I don't remember it. Uh, anything that I've wanted and had, I forget. Uh, it's the things that I've wanted and sort of planned to get and never got, and I'm calling them things to be ambiguous on purpose. Uh, the, 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 these, these issues are never quite resolved. And it feels when you look in retrospect that that particular individual that you desired may have, in fact, you may not really have desired them, but you really love the idea of desiring them. And that desire kept you desiring them when, in fact, you may not have wanted to actually make it possible. So it became deferred desire. And what, you, what really interests me is when you go back in your life and you remember these things, it becomes like the deferral, you remember that which was deferred. In other words, you're really inhabiting a space that has no present, no past, and certainly no future. And in that space, I make my home. It's very interesting because uh, Andre's a, very, he's a poetic writer, not in a florid way, in, in a very disciplined way. And uh, W.S. Merwin used a, um, an epigraph for the beginning of his book, The Lice. This is many years ago. Homer was struck by boys catching lice. They told him, what we catch and kill we leave behind us what escapes us, we bring with us. But that's Heraclitus, by the way. That that's is, what? That's Heraclitus wrote oh, it's this. Heraclitus. Yes, that's one of the little fragments that we have from that brilliant, brilliant man called Heraclitus. Yes. Uh, basically, you want that which you cannot have. Yeah. And one of the images that I love, if I may go on for one second, is the image of Narcissus looking at himself in the pond and falling in love with his face. And this is only in Ovid because Ovid is a genius. Mm -hmm. And he says, that which I want, I already have. And of course, he realizes he's looking at himself. It's not that he's unaware of this. He says, I have what I want, so what else do I want? Why am I wanting? And that is really the kind of desire that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, you have the mic. Yes, in Egypt. Um, when you finish the book and it's published and your vision of the writer is there and the episodes are there, does it continue to tease you in your mind and do you review it and wonder, have you fully understood it as you might want to? Is this always living with you as a somewhat unfinished fiction or do you accept it, this is my, my view uh, with fiction in it, and now that is complete as my vision? I'll tell you something. Um, it was so hard to write. I mean, those guys know. It, though this novel, unlike my others, was much more fun in certain <coughs> ways, but it was so difficult. To, I mean, I worked so hard to think it through that I actually now feel for the first time in any of my books, that I did the best job I could have, or anyone, let me say, could have, in understanding her. I'm not saying it's a great novel, I'm saying that I think I got her. You know, that's, I mean, I, it's, I struggled, struggled with it. It wasn't like easy. But I, I don't feel, I, at this point, that I should have done anything different. So it's over, I mean, basically. Yeah, I think okay. so, unfortunately, because I, I miss her. <laughs> Nancy, you had a question? Well, I was going to ask Judith, who oh, yeah. was Microphone. male novelists who were mother obsessed? Well, they were poets too. Baudelaire, for example, he, he yeah. had the, the mother who uh, married uh, her, uh, Monsieur Baudelaire, 
was a, I, this, it was a no good something or other. And then she married General Opic, who was the head of the um, Ecole Polytechnique, and whom Baudelaire hated. But so, but I, let me think. I have to. I have to go back. I have a list somewhere. Uh, Flaubert. Um, Flaubert. Flaubert obsessed with his mother. Proust. Uh, the French are particularly. Um, Maman. <laughs> Maman. Uh, Thomas Wolfe. Um, Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann. Everybody can join in with one. <laughs> we'll get a nice long one. Uh, let's see. Uh, to some degree, Philip Ross. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, yes. How about Edith Wharton and Amy Lowell for dominant fathers? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. They definitely go on the list. Yeah. And Edith didn't have any children, did she? No. No, she didn't. So a big issue for us. Yeah. yeah. You have a question. Uh, well, since um, Andre has commanded us to turn any kind of comment into a question, um, I'm going to ask De Denisha if she yeah. knows this wonderful anecdote of uh, Ford Maddox Ford. Um, uh, as a child, he describes an elderly aunt of his who always carried about her an acrid smell that he could never identify. And when she died, uh, it was discovered that she wore around her neck a pendant her entire life, into which had been inserted a, s a fragment of a cigar that had been smoked by Franz Liszt at a, <laughs> <laughs> at, a, at a private concert she had attended sometime in 1840 as a young woman. That is so divine. That's fantastic. That is, that women did that with him. They were, it was like Mick Jagger, you know, how the Beatles women used to tear at their clothes, you know, like harpies or like, um, you Physical know. relics of the same. Yeah. Any, That's a great story. Any further questions? <laughs> we still have some time. You sure? What? Sorry? Just <laughs> Oh, okay, um, let's have coffee, you know. This is um, for Judith. So you have this theory, which is really fascinating, especially to me about the women being fa uh, daddy's girls. Um, what do you speculate is behind that? So I know it's a total speculation, but what, what would be the psychology? Well, there's a great book called, by Nancy Chodorow written in the 70s called The Reproduction of Mothering. And it sort of is a book about the history of misogyny. It's a, fun, it's a foundational text of feminism. And since pretty much, until recently anyway, pretty much every infant in the world is um, male or female, has a female mother, uh, and is raised by a mother or a grandmother or by women. This is, again, historically changing, but still it's the norm pretty much everywhere. Boy children have to um, dissociate to form their, every, everyone's identity is female to begin with. And so you have to disambiguate yourself if you're a boy. But if you, and again, let's put this in historical context, things have changed so radically. If you're an ambitious girl, you also have to disambiguate yourself. And I think that the identification with the father is the, is the identification with the worldly independent, is the identification with the principle of autonomy. Now, it's really changing, and it's gonna be fascinating to revisit the, um, the reproduction of mothering uh, in the next 10 years or 15 years. Uh, as men, and Nancy yes. Chodorow said in the 70s, men have to step up to the plate and mother. Yes. Uh, and they are, mm -hmm. to some degree, some places, some men. So it'll be very interesting to see how um, those kids of both, of all genders, uh, work out their relationship to parents, figures in, in, uh, in their creative lives. And it, I, I don't know, I mean, we all have children about the same ages in their 20s and 30s and, mm -hmm. you know, a young adults. And in my son, my son is 27, his generation, they're very um, the young men, they, they expect equality. They don't, it's not some sort of condescending thing that they will do on occasion, put some dishes in a dishwasher. They expect that they, it's a demand that they meet with pretty much good grace. So this is very new to me, you know, it's sort of after the struggles of my lifetime. So uh, that's, it's a great book, I really recommend it. it I haven't read it in a long time, but it, that's where it comes from. Further questions? Mm -hmm. I have yes, questions. sure. Uh, Get the mic first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Judith and Andre. Uh, given how different our social structure is right now, do you think that the you know the 
people who are writing biographies of our contemporaries will be looking at the same issues of family structure and obsession with a parent, or yeah. is it a whole new ball game? That's a great question. Yeah. I, that's a really great question. That, I, well, I mean, first of all, the documentation that they're going to have is going to be different and overwhelming in a different way. In the 19th century, and even in the early 20th century, people wrote millions of letters, and you had all of this first-hand, in handwriting, on paper, daily correspondence with many people. Now, I mean, everybody has millions and millions of emails, but they're not the same. They're brief, usually. People don't, they don't, they don't write, soul, most people don't write soulful, long emails that are actually, could be pages of a journal. They don't, they don't communicate that way. So the amount of documentation that we have is going to be very different, and if it lasts, who knows, the emails seem to disappear and dissolve anyway. Um, and then and the family seems to be a less uh, important um, de definer of people's lives and trajectories. It's the peer group. It's mm -hmm. the, the, the Facebook friends. It's uh, so, uh, you know, people... I think I think it's going to be very different. And and yes, also I think it's going to be. I think it will be very different. What what about the two of you? Don't don't you think that biographies are going to become longer and more ponderous than they've ever been before? No, I think they're no. going to be shorter. I think. No, I think everybody's going to because we're going to have so many facts. They're but going to look into everything. I but think it's happening it. already. I think people don't have the. Don't have the patience for a you know twelve hundred page two volume biography. But isn't that what a lot of people are doing? I mean, they're writing those huge megatomes. On, look at Proust's life, for example. It was a total non-event. The guy right. did absolutely <laughs> That's nothing. That's right. That's right. He did nothing. Okay, and yet we have these tomes after tomes of information about him because he left a lot of letters. That's true. And we have we don't have journal entries, but we have letters and this documentation. And I think that when people are going to start looking into the the parents' lives, uh, and they're going to have all this information, what kind of shrinks he went to see, or she went to, and we'll have so much more information. And but I think those books are greatest foundations for brilliant, uh, brief lives well, that that's come true. later. That's true. The and I think lives. that that only the scholars will leave will read right. the twelve hundred pages, but that. Civilian readers will then um, look to the the, the really 250-page right. brief life, which is, if you're if you're uh, skillful at this, is a fantastic condensation. Right. I mean, I know at the New Yorker, in order to write a profile, you practically have to have as much information as you would need for a biography. Right. So, but you distill it into five or ten thousand words, so it's doable. I mean, you lose, you, the biographer, mourn all the stuff you leave out, but the reader doesn't necessarily. Right. I wonder, can I ask a question? Yeah. Of Judith. I want to know what is going to happen to biography now, just for this, on the same terms that you suggest, that we don't write letters anymore. We don't, some of us keep diaries, but what's going to happen to this art form that you know, you've engaged in? And it will be less text-based and much more based on videos and, yeah. and, uh, and responses to people and I mean, it's sort of, it's like a cracked mirror. If you take anybody, anybody in this audience who Google yourself, it's, it's crazy. It's sort of like a cubist portrait out there mm -hmm. online of things that people have said or you have said or misquotes or whatever it is. And a biographer will have to put that together. So I think it's going to be sort of, it's not going to be straight narrative, old fashioned mm -hmm. narrative from birth to death. It's going to go through the internet. Okay. It's amazing. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesha. Thank, Thank you. you.